So we, we thought we'd start with um, two images, actually. So start at, at the beginning. Uh, Buzz flew twice into space on Gemini 12 and, of course, on Apollo 11. And there's a particular image. <laughs> <laughs> That's not news to you. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> So, th this, Excuse me. Uh, if we could see the, the, the first image, this is um, famous for many reasons, but we were talking about it earlier. It's also, we think, the first ever selfie in space. <laughs> so, Buzz, could you describe this spectacular image from Gemini 12? Well, the mission was ultraviolet photographs of star uh, clusters at night. So uh, Jim Lovell, the commander, would uh, locate the spacecraft at the right position and then turn off the thrusters so they wouldn't fire. While I, with the hatch open, stood on the seat and operated this camera uh, in time exposures, five seconds, uh, 10 seconds, whatever it was, and the spacecraft might be drifting a little, but it would uh, catch this on ultraviolet. Now, between two different night passes, there was about 50 minutes of daylight coming back for the next. So we, we were real sightseers, at least I was, because I was standing in the open hatch and looking down at the parts of Texas and, uh, and other parts. And I was reminded there's cameras behind me. I, I, gee, I wonder if it could take a picture of me. So, <laughs> and it turned out pretty good. Yeah. I, I, I didn't check the lighting too well. Um, we'd have to either move the sun or we'd have to <laughs> move a little in, in orbit to another location. But. So, so to get the, the, <laughs> the geometry, so you're in the Gemini spacecraft. I suppose it's smaller than this, actually. And, and, and Jim Lovell had to sit in his seat with his spacesuit on, and you got to stand. Did he not say to you, I, I would like well, to the, pop the out? Well, the two seats <laughs> were sort of like this uh, because they were ejection seats. And if you eject, you go in slightly different. But you do that on the launch pad uh, if you had to. Yeah. So you could eject from Gemini mm -hmm. after launch. Yes, there wasn't an escape tower uh, the way Mercury uh, had and the way Apollo did also. Yeah. Now, you, you um, pioneered the, the early spacewalk technology, didn't you, because of your interest in diving. I think you said to me that you'd wanted to um, do it, that. It, it's a little bit the other way around. We were experiencing difficulties, some missions had to be uh, stopped or terminated early and we didn't get to do the spacewalking. Um, or there was a, uh, a, a situation where the person doing the spacewalk was getting uh, overheated and then he got frustrated in trying to do something. So there, there was not really a great success. Uh, Mike Collins, um, on uh, Gemini 10, had a maneuvering gun. He opened the hatch and moved out uh, and, and did everything with a, actually it was a dead Agena. It, it was left up there from the previous mission. Uh, but when he got back in, he had to mess around with the uh, umbilical. Um, so we always had uh, some things going wrong. and. Uh, I had been training to do this uh, backpack maneuvering unit on, uh, on the last flight, Gemini 12, because it hadn't been flown on the flight nine uh, before. I was on the backup crew on that one. Uh, so this was the last chance to use this number one Air Force experiment. And, uh, Someone had suggested from around Baltimore, they did some uh, research and discovered that if you were neutrally buoyant uh, underwater, that 
uh, it behaved quite a bit like uh, being in space where you would be floating. So they had suggested, and, and being a scuba diver from nine years previous, I, I felt, yeah, this, this I think will really work. Some of the other astronauts said, uh, no, we don't think that's good. But they were wrong and I was right. <laughs> and it did make things easier, but still, NASA was a little conservative, so they canceled the backpack maneuvering unit. And I was really disappointed because I would have loved to have separated and, and fly around the spacecraft. NASA insisted on a 100-foot tether. Now, all that would do is get in your way. Um, but those of you who've seen the movie Gravity, uh, George Clooney was flying around with a backpack. That's what I was going to do. <laughs> but, but it was canceled. On, on that flight, on, on Gemini 12. Yes. So uh, I, I just did some very simple tasks. But it, uh, uh, there were three different successful EVAs, short, the, the long one taking uh, the selfie, mm. and then another one where uh, I was going to activate the backpack. And then there was a uh, garbage disposal EVA. We had some things that we needed to get rid of. So we <laughs> opened up the hatch, and you would appreciate this. We were flying like this, and I had these, and I threw them up, straight up, not thinking that, oh, they're going to go up come back, <laughs> yeah. and one orbit laser, there, sure enough, <laughs> there they were. Yeah. They, they just passed buying it. <laughs> yeah, because I think I remember talking to Chris Hadfield recently about when they throw things off the space station. You, you, you're supposed to throw them down and forwards, aren't you, to get them out of the way, I think. Is that right? You said what you said, if you throw them up, you just meet them again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you said there that you mentioned well, it. Oh, if you throw them down, then they're going to go like this, and maybe they'll come back. <laughs> I, sh I should say, because your, your PhD was on this, wasn't it, at MIT? It was on docking maneuvers in orbit or orbital dynamics. And I, I remember I read that you talked about the conservative nature of NASA. That you, but so you became an astronaut in '63, mm. on the and then on the back of that PhD from MIT, and then three years later. You're in space, so the pace of it seems to be anything but conservative in that sense. Well, yes. Uh, when when the training for Gemini was going on, some of the early missions, and I helped to train some of the people uh, along with the company, McDonnell Douglas, uh, for the first rendezvous. And I had uh, asked the top guy, uh, I said, you know, I'd like to fly on one of these rendezvous flights. He didn't say anything. <laughs> but then as the assignments came out, um, I was going to back up a flight and then switch to prime crew, but there wasn't any mission. Hmm. So I wasn't going to fly on Gemini. But then a tragedy uh, took the life of uh, my backdoor neighbor and then we moved to replace him uh, on Gemini 9, and they had a crew for 10 and 11, so then Jim Lovell and I flew on Gemini 12, yeah. and that was a success. So then I was in good position to uh, be selected to fly an Apollo mission. Yeah. So Neil and I were assigned to what eventually became Apollo 8 the first flight to orbit the moon. And that was really a wonderful flight to be on the backup group and, and to see all the training. And Neil and I worked pretty close together on that. And then the normal rotation would be, after Apollo 8, there was a crew to Apollo 9 and 10. So we would fly on Apollo 11. And if everything worked out, we might be able to make the first 
attempted landing. And it all worked out pretty good. <laughs> So speaking of that, we have a, a second picture that we wanted to talk about, which is, which is this one from Apollo 11. Um, I, I should ask, um, who is that a photograph of? It's, I suppose it's a fairly obvious answer that it would be Buzz, <laughs> given the, <laughs> the conversation we're having. But mo many <laughs> it's probably the most famous picture from the surface of the moon, I would say. And many people say that's Neil Armstrong, but in fact, it's you and Neil in the reflection. So what was the, the story of that? It's probably the most iconic photograph well, in human history, actually. I Neil to... was such an excellent photographer. <laughs> See, I, I, I was walking along like this, and he said, hey, stop. So I stopped and looked at him, and he took the picture right away. And uh, uh, you can see parts, uh, well, you can identify that, that I was just still moving a little bit. Um, but people ask me because it's so, so well staged and we call it the visor picture yeah. because the reflection in the visor will show the landing craft and it'll show the white suited astronaut, Neil, that took the picture. And uh, you can see my shadow uh, moving out. So we call that the, the visor picture. Uh, but people have asked me, why is that such a perfect, an iconic picture? And I've got three words. Location? <laughs> Location? <laughs> Location. <laughs> I, I should ask you be, be about that. You must have been asked <laughs> all the time over the last decades, but what, what, to, to land on the moon and, and to walk out, you, you've spoken about it many times, but it might be worth saying a few words about what that feels like to come down the ladder and onto the surface of the moon. Well, we certainly knew that the pressure was going to be on us to uh, be able to, to do that, uh, of course, to, to all of us. The most important thing in that mission was to make a landing. Because if you don't make a landing, you can't go outside. You have to do it again. And then, but that's uh, not the way the, uh, the press and the media see it. What's the most important thing is opening the hat, going down the ladder. Well, that was easy. <laughs> but uh, there was some controversy because it was the first time that two people were going to go out. Previously, on all previous space walks, the commander was so occupied uh, training for the very complex things he had to do and make decisions. So generally, the experiments were given to the pilot. NASA doesn't like the word co-pilot, but uh, the, the pilot always did the spacewalking, and, and as I did on Gemini 12, I was the pilot, and Jim Lovell was the commander. Uh, but it, uh, for, for a number of reasons, it was decided that uh, I think the uh, customary thing uh, would be that the commander does the leading of his troops, and he should be the one symbolically to go down, and, uh, and that was the way it was decided. The experiment still, still should have been uh, uh, overseen by the, the junior person, me. Uh, that isn't quite the way it worked out, because Neil was down there first, and then he began, I began following him around. And uh, that's, that worked out fine. And did, did you, you, was there any suggestion then that, that, that you stay in there? Because it does seem to make sense, doesn't it, that somebody's there, you don't know what's going to happen, it's the first time on the moon. It's quite bold, actually, to send both astronauts out. I mean, th was there any discussion about that? Would they say to you, actually, no, you're there, not going out? <laughs> there really <laughs> wasn't. Uh, if you put a person out there uh, and, and he were to have some trouble, best thing is to have somebody right yeah. behind him, not somebody back 
uh, in the spacecraft. Now, if the spacecraft is flying and the person outside, then you might have to move the spacecraft over to pick him up, or you might have to uh, be the boss, be the person in charge, and, and your junior person is out there doing something. Yeah. And I think we, we touched on it before, but the, the, the rate of technological development and that, that move from Kennedy's speech in less than a decade to the moon. Um, I, did you think when you heard Kennedy's speech, first of all, that you would have a chance of being in the space program? And secondly, that indeed, by the end of the decade, mm. there would be a mission to the moon? Well, when he gave that speech in May, of 1961, I was still at MIT. And uh, I was kind of working on my uh, rendezvous thesis, dealing mostly with rendezvous around the Earth. But I'd pretty well finished that, and then it looked like uh, there was a, a debate, sort of, between uh, Werner von Braun and the science advisor, who both thought, well, it started with uh, the lander that uh, von Braun and his people had designed. It was big, and it would have required uh, a much bigger rocket, the Nova rocket with nine engines, but that wouldn't be ready until into the 70s, so that wouldn't work. So they had to use two. Saturn V, the first would put up the rocket stage that would take the spacecraft to the moon. So then you'd send up the spacecraft and you'd join together in Earth orbit and go to the moon and the big spacecraft would then do pretty much everything. But an engineer from uh, another center came along and said, now if, if you look at the task of taking somebody from the Earth and putting them on the moon, and you break that up into pieces, you need to send uh, a command module to the moon with the crew, and it needs a service module. But when you get to the moon, you need to have a lander and an ascent stage. So if you put those together, then you land, and you come up with the ascent stage, you have to join up with the other ship to come back home. So we leave one person there and put two people down on the surface. And that was judged to be very risky. But it was by far the, the easier way to, to do that. And it only required one big rocket whereas the other system required two. But that wasn't the argument, it was how risky this is versus how safe this is, because they wanted to sell more rockets, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, to me, was, and to many others, was the most uh, decisive deciding how to get there that really made the mission successful. Mm -hmm. So you think it was obviously the right choice in the sense that, mm -hmm. that it worked. But in terms of uh, developing a system that could go onwards out to Mars and beyond, would it, would it have been better to go for those bigger rockets and that more flexible and complicated system? Uh, well, it might have let Leonov land first. And we didn't want that to have it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was the right choice because it seems obvious now everyone who grows up with Apollo you, the, the, the LEM and there's a command module and, the service, and it just seems like the way to do it but it is worth reflecting that back in 61 nobody knew how to do that at all it's a blank sheet of paper and, and after we did it the way that it worked uh, I'm sure that those two people still felt that we should have done it their way yeah but they were wrong. It would have cost more. And, uh, they said, well, if we join things up in Earth orbit, maybe that'll uh, lead to a space station. Now, now that was uh, much, much later that that would come along. Now, uh, I have a 
strategy that uh, makes lunar activities much, much better than that. But I can't tell you. Uh, I was just about to ask. So you'll say nothing about that. <laughs> what do you, do you, did you think on in in '69 um, we that there was many more Apollo missions planned? Did you think that we'd go straight to a moon base, essentially, in a single program with Saturn V launching that technology? W was that what you felt would happen? Well, when the three of us came back from a 45-day uh, trip around the world, stopping at different places, kings and queens and prime ministers, uh, we came back and had uh, dinner in the White House. And the president uh, said, well, what do you guys want to do now? He said, Mike, I know you've been talking to uh, Secretary Rogers about the State Department. And uh, Neil said, well, I want to uh, uh, work on aero aeronautics, airplane flying, and the work that NASA would be doing. <clears throat> and I said, well, I, I want to really return back to the service that I was in the Air Force. And uh, I became the first uh, astronaut that did go back. Uh, now quite a few of them do. Uh, and it's been rewarding, so not, not in my case. But uh, uh, now, we, we could have stayed in the crew rotation. But I think uh, about then, they were beginning to look at uh, maybe not flying the last two. There were. Uh, 20 missions, able, but 18, 19, and 20 uh, were canceled out. Mm. And you went back, just, you mentioned you went Except back Except in Michener's book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, but it became Apollo Soyuz, didn't it, one of them? I think it was one of them used for that. Well, af after the last mission, people had been looking at what can we do with this Apollo equipment? And it looked like the upper stage of the, the rocket. There was a first, second, and third stage that uh, went into orbit with the rest of us. Uh, but if you didn't have the rest of us there, it could go into orbit itself and become uh, a container for people to then visit. And there were two ways of doing that. One was to uh, have fuel in it, but burn the fuel out. And you could do that with uh, Saturn I. But if you wanted it empty when you launched it, then you'd have to use a much bigger Saturn V. Hmm. And it was decided to do the latter. Uh, probably a good idea, because to go up to uh, station and get inside, and uh, it had been filled with hydrogen, and now you were coming in and putting 100% oxygen into it. Maybe that's not the smart way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so and you, you just mentioned briefly. But we did Skylab yeah. and flew to that for three times, 28 days, 50 six and then 84 days. And, and we really learned a bit about operating. And of course, the Russians, Soviets, have been doing Salyut stations. And uh, so after the last landing, uh, there was a period of detente somewhat between the Soviet Union and uh, the United States the ABM Treaty was signed. And it was felt by some people, I'm, I'm told, that it was a, an offer of rewarding from us to the Soviets a peaceful, let's do a joint mission in space. You go up there, and we'll come up and rendezvous with you. We'll build the thing that will join the two of us together. And uh, that became the joint mission in space. And looking back on it, it's a legacy that from 1975 
up to the present time has led to rather peaceful sharing activities in space at the time that the Soviet Union came apart and, and then other things happened. And uh, of course I can't help but project into the future now that, uh, that we could have a spacecraft that could dock with the Chinese. Mm. Uh, and, and that could have that kind of a long-term legacy of relations in space that would be cordial, peaceful, and that just might lead to uh, more acceptable, peaceful relations here on Earth. I, I know um, you'd uh, just been speaking to Stephen Hawking, was it yesterday or the day before here, and um, you'd had questions for him. And I noticed in one of his answers that he said that he felt that Apollo was the, the most important thing that humanity has done. I suppose he meant as the, the first step out into the cosmos. So, so, of course, I suppose there's some modesty involved here, but I wanted to ask you whether, whether you feel that, looking back at the whole program, the, from, through Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, whether that was perhaps the pinnacle of our achievement so far. Well, it certainly was a bold step of progress. When, when we made that commitment, we hadn't even put anyone in orbit yet. So it, it clearly was uh, a big movement forward. The Russians had put Yuri Gagarin in space. We're probably going to do, and they did, many, many more things. But the two-man spacecraft, the Gemini spacecraft, is where we really began to learn more things than the one-man Mercury that couldn't even translate. It could uh, rotate, but not translate. And you have to translate with the Gemini to be able to make the rendezvous maneuver. So it was uh, a very essential in between and prepared us for being able to carry out much more complicated things with Apollo. Now, having done that and seen what an impact that had in our country and the world, I think that being able to do that sort of a joint mission in space could have long-term uh, effects on it. So uh, the plan I have uh, starts out very uh, briefly in low Earth orbit and then does things at the moon so that we can put things together. But we need all the nations to come together. We don't want to compete with China, that would just make it very, very messy. Right now, they're, they're ahead of us by quite a bit because we've made some decisions that are not all that uh, uh, productive. Um, but if we can do things together uh, in Earth orbit where we know a good I mean, at the moon, where we know a good thing about uh, helping them. Uh, Europe and Japan, Europe has an agreement with Russia to work together at the moon. And uh, we in the United States would like to work with the commercial people that could use uh, the water, the ice, the water, and the fuel uh, to be able to uh, aid and assist missions going elsewhere to Mars. Uh, so that's very important to so us. So you see the return to the moon as a, a development step, a learning step, to learn to be, I suppose, self-sufficient on a body beyond well, the Earth. Well, it first. enables us to help the other nations and they jointly make use of permanence. 
We never had permanence. We landed, came back. The last mission was three days. They had a rover, but they still landed and then came back. Uh, so to make uh, activities on the moon, you'd like to leave, land and stay there for a month, three months, six months, and, and rotate, keep somebody there all the time and a permanent, and that's the sort of thing we'd certainly like to have at Mars. So the design should be the same, and the procedures of joining them together, we can learn at the moon so that we can make sure we do it right. Can, can I just ask you about the, the atmosphere in NASA at that time? Because it strikes me, you know, but I, I think everyone here is probably a fan of space exploration, but that time scale, I mean, the fact that you find that the first manned test flight of Apollo is, what is it, October 68, December 68, you go around the moon. July 69, you land on the moon. So less than a year from first test flight. What, what was the atmosphere a, a, a test flying, sort of rather more military atmosphere? We just, we have to do this and we will, we will take risks if necessary. We'll just get on with it. We'll do the engineering, we'll do it. What, is that, how different is that today? And, and the first question is, what was mm. the atmosphere like at the time? Um, it was competitive um, <clears throat> because the, at, at that time, the, the Russians, in a sense, were maybe a little ahead of us. We had the Apollo fire, lost three crew members in Apollo 1, and so that slowed up our momentum. And then it, it looked as though the Russians had sent an unmanned spacecraft, and it was not a small spacecraft, that went around the moon and then landed uh, in uh, Aral Sea, I think. And they did that again, unmanned, and landed in the normal landing place where Russia lands. And we felt it was just a matter of time for them to put a cosmonaut in there and go around the moon first. So that's why we accelerated the second mission of Apollo. So Apollo the first, the first was just in Earth orbit, but the second mission would have been the first time anyone got on the big rocket, and uh, we decided to send them to the moon in orbit. Very bold maneuver, and it saved us probably about six months of development time, because then we could follow that with uh, testing the lunar module in Earth orbit and uh, in lunar orbit, and then uh, we could perhaps land. So you just have an atmosphere where everybody, the engineers, the, the, the astronauts, everybody's just focused on <laughs> whatever it takes to... I remember, I remember talking to uh, it was Charlie Duke, and I asked him a similar question, and he said, well, you, when you've got um, 400,000 people and unlimited budget, you can do a lot. And is that the, was that the kind of atmosphere, whatever it takes? Get them headed in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. We, we're going to take some questions from the audience in, in a moment, but I just wanted to ask you about um, Mars, just <coughs> briefly, because that, that's your, your passion now, isn't it? Just aiming to get a mission to Mars. Well, it's not like it's a new thought. Uh, in 1969, July, we landed, and then they had a space task group do some studies, and uh, they looked at three levels of intensity. And uh, the highest intensity, they felt we could get to Mars in the, sometime in the 80s, 1980s. And the slowest, would still get to Mars before the year 2000. Well, that was a very optimistic uh, study, but, but there was that focus on Mars as early as that, and it has been the ultimate objective for, I don't know, five presidents now. Mm. But there hasn't been the steps leading to that that make it a firm decision that's what we're going to do. So, so the, in the 80s, you would have used Saturn V's 
or the, the bigger, the Nova who, booster? And you who knows what we would have used it. Uh, now, um, of course, that was a great rocket. Uh, personally, I think it's, it was better than the rocket that is being worked on now to be the rocket to take us to Mars. Um, uh, so but there's been a lot of shifting around. Uh, we, we felt we needed to do something that was reusable. And there was a study to make quite an advanced reusable two-stage that was canceled and then we rushed into the shuttle design and uh, perhaps in retrospect skipped a few things because we had the crew and the cargo in one big airplane. So there was no way to separate the crew except to take the whole airplane with you. And uh, that was decided not the thing to do after the uh, accident board. So we, uh, by that time, we'd begun putting up a space station, had some place to go. Mm. And just while we're talking about the future, I just, um, we, we noted down, you, you mentioned the, the, the two things that you're working on now. So you've got the Buzz Aldrin Space Institute at Florida Institute of Technology, mm -hmm. which is really looking at the, the Mars missions, but with the, with the, the cycler orbits. Yeah. So perhaps you could just comment very, briefly on that, because that's an interesting, ambitious well, plan. Pre President Bush's uh, uh, mission was called uh, a vision for space exploration. And some of us decided that a vision for space is more than just exploration. It's a number of things, uh, but whatever it is, we should unify space vision. And uh, I enumerated the things and nobody's improved on it, but we have exploration that we develop something. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> exploration and science is the second more important. I mean, knowing the science, we develop that. Hopefully it can become commercial. And the last and most important is security. All of this must lead to uh, increasing the security of, of the nation. Uh, and that's why that gets more resources. Mm. So unified space vision is what my plan was. Now, does that tell you very much? No, it doesn't. Mm. <laughs> but we did a study uh, uh, of a rather complete at Purdue University and uh, then I decided, I need to get a little bit more concise. This, the feature of the plan is getting to Mars. And the way to get to Mars that is different from other people's ways is to have a perpetual, a continuous cycling between Earth and Mars. And it may not go right back, it may do, you may have two cyclers. And uh, it gets more economical that way. And that, that has been what we've been pursuing now. But it's cycling orbits. So these are these So are I wanted to call it cycling pathways to occupy Mars. Not just visit and come back, but to keep Mars occupied. You go and you stay and other people come and then you may come back. So th these are uh, a stable orbit. You build a space station, essentially, which is like a conveyor belt, mm -hmm. or several space stations, which are constantly orbiting for free once you get them going, and you ride them backwards and forwards, transfer resources. I suppose the idea is that unlike Apollo and unlike the shuttle, these are things that have a, they're a, a framework for continued exploration, building one on top of the other. Well, you, you first put a cycler into the orbit. You make sure it's... But now it's going to swing by the Earth. So as it swings by, you join up. And it gets to Mars, and you get off. Now the only thing that you need to take there is a lander. 
because the rest of the things have been put together on the ground. Mm -hmm. And the only thing uh, for the route going is six months worth of life support. So if you can take one lander, maybe you can take two, and you can take three. And, and that provides a system with uh, redundancy. If one engine fails, then you can discard that and uh, still get there with the uh, other systems. Other ways don't have that yeah. redundancy. I just had one last question before you open it to the audience, which is with a commitment from the world, let's, as you said, everybody who's scientific advanced nations cooperating together, when could you begin to build that infrastructure if we wanted to? Well, it, it would be impossible to say if we got all the nations together and said, okay, we're all going to contribute to do this. No one nation could do it in a reasonable time. You'd have to be skipping and uh, still you would come up short or it would be very costly and take uh, a good bit of time. And besides, the other nations, Europe, Russia, Japan, China, haven't gone to the moon yet. They would like to do that and uh, then maybe go to Mars. Um, I've, I've always suspected that if the Russians say, oh, we're going to build a permanent base on the moon to convince us that we should build a permanent base. And then they'll change their mind and they'll go to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> but but we, we really don't want to do it that way. <laughs> we want to help them not compete. I mean, the worst thing would be to compete with China. And it, it's not real peaceful in the South China Sea right now. Um, but it wasn't really that peaceful between the Soviet Union and the United States back in uh, 1975. So we could be doing some things in orbit or at the moon. Mm. And the Chinese, in chatting with them, know that they would like to have some of our experience. Now, maybe they're just telling us that, but. Um, I, I really think that they would. They know a lot more than we knew back then. Mm. Uh, but, but I think it would just be so unproductive for them to do things their way and for us to try and catch up. Yeah. The best way is to bring all the nations together and then let China advance and other nations will advance but we can pool our resources and set up uh, a degree of permanent occupancy at the moon where people might go for six months uh, and then rotate crews so there would always be somebody so like, there. Like the space station. Doing then. different things, like, like the space station. Okay, well let's, let's uh, have some questions from the audience. So, so stick your hand up, um, if you will, and it's a uh, particularly value <laughs> questions from the younger members of the audience, actually. Is anyone, is anyone here who's, uh, there's, a there's one there, yes, go on. Nobody in the front row here. <laughs> 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 Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Would the vacuum in, would the vacuum on the moon be like, uh, the same as the vacuum in space? So, there's a vacuum on the moon, just like in space. There's no air. Uh, so when the sun uh, comes on the surface, it warms up the surface. And when the sun is gone, it, the, the heat leaves. And the sun is shining for 14 days as it goes over because it takes 28 days for the 
moon to go around the Earth. So when it's dark, it does get quite cold. And uh, a lot of the spacecraft have to sort of be shut down and maybe they won't wake up uh, after being so cold. And there's no atmosphere. The radiation from the sun for a solar flare would be very difficult for people on the moon as it would be for people leaving the Earth outside the magnetic belts and, and heading somewhere where else. So you need to uh, apply some radiation protection. And, and that's still a little debatable as to just how much. To get rid of all of it would be very, very expensive and very uh, costly to put that much uh, weight up there. So there's always uh, a compromise. So um, it's a, a difficult but the environment. vacuum outside the spacecraft in orbit is the same all the way to Mars and all the way around the moon. It's, it's a vacuum. No air to breathe. You gotta take your oxygen along with you. So, questions, is there? I'm finding it quite difficult to see. Actually. Oh, there's one, there's one right at the front there. That's great. No, it's okay, you can okay. ask the question. Um, so currently NASA seems to be working very hard with commercial uh, companies such as Boeing, Sierra Nevada Corporation, people like that, uh, to, in order to produce spacecraft um, to send people on cargo to space. Do you feel like this is a good plan going forward? Um, what are our thoughts on this? Well, it certainly is. The, uh, the, the government spacecraft right from the beginning, we didn't have any comparison, but they were not cheap. Uh, and if there had been uh, some company able to put something together, it would have been rather expensive to do that competing uh, with the government. But, but we've... Uh, worked it so that the government can help companies put together a spacecraft and they'll have a contract to then deliver people to the space station. Uh, you start with delivering cargo first. Uh, and we're in the process of uh, doing that now with, with uh, two companies and it'll be three pretty soon. Uh, and then there are some contracts already for uh, SpaceX and, uh, and also Boeing to take people up to the station. Uh, we don't have the shuttle anymore. And we don't have the commercial, and we don't have the government uh, Orion. Now, uh, when it, w it was decided in beginning of 04 to uh, not fly the shuttle past 2010, we assumed that in seven years we could come up with something, but it's not there yet, and it probably won't be for um, until 2021 maybe. Uh, so that means that if the commercial companies can begin to take people up then we won't have to use the Russian Soyuz. Right now, we're, we're paying 20, 70 million or more for each astronaut to go up to a space station that we've invested $100 billion in. That's not very smart. How did we get here? Well, we need to look back and see what it is, uh, and I've got a think tank underway. We're just looking for a little uh, funding, but we're ready to go to begin to look back at good things, not so good, and also look to the future. 
Uh, so that's one project that I have started, but it's not underway. The other one is my uh, cycling pathways for Occupy Mars. And that year by year, evolutionary steps at intermediate objectives, maybe an asteroid, maybe fly by Venus. Other people are doing things at the moon. We're developing refueling so that we can uh, be able to put things on the surface of Mars from the moon of Mars, and then eventually uh, go and land. So it's a step by step. So, so you don't lose that momentum again. You don't lose that expertise as we did. After well, college. it it still starts off kind of slow, hmm. um, but we're really not ready to put a lot of money into it. Uh, uh, I hope that that we can begin to build up that financial support to be able to design efficient rockets and spacecraft that, that really are needed. Yeah. Should we take another, we, we maybe let an older person ask a question. <laughs> well, yeah, I was gonna try and go further back, you see. The, well, right at the back there, so what, someone at the back who's got their hand up, because it's not, and then we'll try. we've got, we've got, I think, we're running out of time a bit, but I was told we could overrun a little bit, because, you know, has anyone got anything <laughs> urgent they want to do? <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> uh, the sky grew a lot clearer when, when you went up. Uh, are you afraid that future generations won't be able to follow in the footsteps of the space debris? So, uh, the, the question is about space, space debris. debris. So the danger of being operating in orbit with all the stuff that's there. Uh, it is a growing problem. There's no, no doubt about it. And there are people working on ways there's not a big incentive. There's not a prize for how much garbage you can bring back. <laughs> Maybe that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it would be a good thing to do. It'd be a good thing to uh, yeah. have climate change not happen, okay? But we have pressing things right now, and that's uh, how, <laughs> how do we uh, get the other nations together doing things that are needed to have the confidence to then go and put together a base on Mars. And, and you can't do that from the Earth. You can do the slow moving things close together, but it'll take time. Now, if you put people at the moon of Mars, it's much better but it's costly to get people there. And, and uh, to have people at the moon of Mars bringing, pe bringing pieces that are a mile apart, that's valuable time doing things that we could have done from Earth if we take enough time to do that. And there are ways of being able to space out the launches and use launchers from all nations to be able, one nation just couldn't do uh, the things that are necessary to, to build up uh, a location on Mars that you would be confident of landing and, and staying there for several years. Uh, some other people could come and you could come back. There, there are a lot of things that really should be done before the first people go down. And it is so much more efficient without going into the details. Two rovers on either side in five years accomplished a certain amount. The, the project manager said, manager said what they did in five years could have been done in one week if we had human intelligence in orbit so that we could control things with a second time delay uh, instead of 15 minutes. Yeah, so you can do a lot back. more science as well as 
the expiration. But, it, of the but it's nice if you have a, a base that uh, lends itself to uh, easy uh, coming together. If they're just arbitrarily, uh, then it's difficult. Yeah. I tell you what, we, we just we, we talked about Mars in the future, but we sat here in front of these images, and I just it just uh, occurred to me a question I've I've never asked actually because I don't I've ne you, you flew on the so the Atlas rocket wasn't it Gemini, and then and then the Saturn V uh, on Apollo. I, I wondered what it no, was. No, the uh, the target, the Agena target, flew on Atlas. Uh, Mercury uh, capsule flew on Atlas. Yeah, or Gemini. Yeah. We was flew. On a ICBM, Titan. Oh, Titan. Titan yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> well, you almost uh, part of my suits. question there. You, you you got on top of an ICBM and flew it into orbit, um, and then yeah. you get on, on the Saturn. All the Russians five. did the same thing. What what, what is it as a pilot? Um, how? What are the differences, and how thrilling is it to pilot that vehicle? I mean, Saturn V is the most powerful flying machine we've ever built to this day, right? So wh what is it like to pilot that thing? Do, do you feel you're piloting? You're not piloting, it? you're along for the ride. <laughs> you just light the touch paper. <laughs> Technically, if things did go wrong, there is a way you could do some steering. Nobody's ever done it, fortunately. But, but there is that provision with the uh, hand controller that if the guidance for the engines started to veer off that you could possibly get it straightened away and then separate. Yeah. Not bail out, but separate uh, with a parachute and yeah. complicate. So, so it's a very, very different experience then to, to flying a, a fast jet, flying an aircraft. It's a, it's a, it, does anything prepare you for Flying. Well, the the Gemini spacecraft was really a pilot's spacecraft because you could maneuver it. You could go up, down, forward, and you could do the maneuvers to bring spacecraft together. And uh, you could dock, as we did, with uh, our, another rocket that had a powerful engine, and then it could take you up to... Uh, 800 miles mm. that we did that on, on one mission. We were supposed to do it on Gemini 12, but something went wrong. We didn't do it. Yeah. But uh, that spacecraft really was one that you could maneuver. Apollo was so programmed in its pathway that it just wasn't the sort of thing that you could move around. Everything was very well orchestrated mm. uh, to be part of the total total flight plan of getting there. Yeah. So so really the thing is that you on the rocket you just sit there and wait until you get into orbit, but then the then the flying starts. Well, you know, I get in uh, before I go flying an airliner, I'm talk to the pilots and uh, then I flew around the world with some people that knew what they were doing. And uh, they set things up with the buttons that flies itself. It's not being flown mm. <laughs> except for uh, landing and, uh, and takeoff. So we're getting very mechanical and, and as a result, in some cases, when the pilots do take over uh, to make a landing, they're not always as proficient as they should be. You can be too automated. Mm. Um, and if something goes wrong when it's automated, uh, you better know how to recover from it. I just want to take one last question, but were you busy? So the, I was reading Norman Mailer's book, A Fire on the Moon, recently, which had this terrific description of Apollo 11 taking off. And um, so uh, at that moment when the countdown finishes and you take off, are you busy or are you, what's going through your mind? Are you just thinking, Christ, this is, this, is a, this is a hell of a ride. Or are you really, checklist, checklist, checklist? Well, there's a thought in the back of your mind. You've gone through all this preparation. You're up there on the top and they're beginning to count down. A lot of times there's a hold and then there's a scrub. 
and you got to come back down, and you got to go through all of that again one or two days later. You don't want to do that, so you're really hoping that nothing goes wrong. And uh, when, when the engines light, they're 300 feet below you. And, and if you're out in a crowd, it's big, loud noise, shockwaves. But you're up here, you don't hear that. <laughs> you got a headset on and you're talking. <laughs> it, <laughs> it increases a little bit. Now, <laughs> when the three of us started talking about what the liftoff was like, we all three concluded that the exact moment of leaving the ground was not that discernible, except for the countdown, but there was not any force. But we, we said to each other, we felt like we were being guided with the hmm. guidance to most dangerous part uh, of that launch is going sideways and crashing into the tower because it's a big, big boom and uh, you may not be able to get away from it in time. So when the rocket clears the tower, that's the point where the control from uh, the launch pad, Kennedy Space Center, the control of the spacecraft is switched over to mission control in Houston once they pass the tower clear. And you relax then. <laughs> well, but, but we're still not feeling that much. It's smooth and gradually pushed down. And then it, about four minutes, uh, we've reached about three and a half, four Gs, and we're pushed back, but again, it's smooth. And when the engine cuts off, we sort of move ahead in the seat. It is uh, not a uh, traumatic. We've seen pictures of the shuttle. When they take off, there's somebody, cameras going, and they're bouncing around like this. Mm -hmm. It's the shock waves, supposedly, between the uh, big solid rockets. Mm -hmm. uh, not knowing that much about, I suspect it's more than that, because the four segment solid uh, has some instabilities near burnout. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a problem when we went to five segment. And that sort of terminated that program uh, of going to the moon in the um, vision for space exploration yeah. um, in 2010. So it's still difficult to build those rockets. We've got, it's, it's 10 past three actually, we're supposed to finish at three. Well, let's say one last question and then we'll do. Go on, is, I, I know there's loads of older people. Is, are there any more are there younger members of the audience? So there's one right over there. Let's do that. Oh, yeah. You've been really great. Yeah, that'd be great. And, uh, can you see him there with the microphones? Or her, I can't see him. Well, there's no doubt that the technology has, has come a long ways. Um, when, when somebody tells me that their iPhone ha has more computing power than our computer did in the spacecraft, I get a little resentful. <laughs> now, I know we didn't have a lot of storage, but my answer to them is, well, see, now I can take this and throw it up in the air. 
Now, can it take a star sighting and know exactly what its position is? And can it command a maneuver of rockets? Can it land? No, it's going to crash and break. <laughs> it can show a lot of pictures and a lot of names and things. It all depends on what you design something to do. Uh, yes, I've seen the glass cockpits of airplanes, uh, and, and it is a marvel, much, much different than, than when I flew uh, in the Korean War. Uh, and ours were much better <laughs> than the Russians that the Koreans flew. Uh, but there's still a degree of automation. Uh, and you have a tendency to let the autopilot fly. And when you do that, um, you're not getting the feeling of the response uh, of the craft. So I'm, I'm not legally flying, but when I do go with somebody and they let me fly the airplane, I'm not going to turn the autopilot on. I'm going to fly the thing. <laughs> all I can to get uh, the, the practice. Uh, and we will have, we do, drones flying around with no pilot in them. And for fighter pilots, we don't like to be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I <love> but <laughs> uh, the drone, you don't have to bring back. You don't have to feed them. I love what you said that. It's a, maybe it's a great summary of the spirit of the age when you said even it exists today when you said, I'm not legally flying, but when I fly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to answer that. <laughs> oh, I, I, I do a lot of riding. But, yeah. You know, the rules now, you can't be up in the cockpit uh, in an airliner. Yeah. But oh, I, I have one more thing. My father was uh, uh, the contemporary of uh, Jimmy Doolittle, and in World War II, he was the person that called back, both of them, into World War II, and Jimmy Doolittle trained straight away to uh, take off from a carrier that would be close to Japan, and they would bomb Tokyo, and they did, and uh, they'd take off early, so a lot of them crashed in China or were in prison in Russia. But uh, Jimmy Doolittle became a real hero and, and somebody that uh, I looked up to. And when my father passed away, I spent a little bit more time visiting with him. And I just loved to tell him, because he was the first one to take off on the aircraft gear, and the airplanes were behind him. So he had the shortest. And I used to tell him, Jimmy, our rocket was taller than your takeoff roll was. <laughs> 360 feet is all he had to get airborne. And uh, his co-pilot is still alive. He's 100 years old. Yeah. Yeah. And that's only, so that was 30 years as well, wasn't it? And, and they've been having reunions. And that's why I, I want to the Apollo people and the Gemini people to have reunions so we can build up the public interest of what we were able to do and what we may be able to do in the future up to the 50th anniversary of when we landed. That should be a big deal. Yeah. yeah and you, that's a big deal for some president to say, we should land on Mars. Yeah, yeah. It would be a fitting tribute, wouldn't it? But, uh, well, look, I, I know many of you, perhaps all of you, are going to meet Buzz um, after the short break we're going to have to get books signed, etc. I should say these T-shirts as well. They're, they're, if you can buy these, I think, here. Can you buy them here? You can order them right now. Order. You can order them because, because all the money's um, for the uh, Share Space Foundation, uh, which goes to the, one of the things of the giant destination Mars map, which is a huge <laughs> map you can use in schools. And we were talking before, if there are teachers here or you want to tell your school, you, you can buy those things. Oh, you can, you can apply for them, actually, can't you? And they're funded partly by these t-shirts. So 
I said it. Uh, sharespace.org, yeah. But for now, so we're going to finish with a, a short video of the, of the Tim Peake launch, talking about space as it is today. Um, we, we're going to retire for a few minutes, and then, so you, if you stay seated, and then Buzz will come back with the signing table, etc., and then you can all come down and chat to Buzz. You want to find out then. more about what we're doing? Buzzaldrin.com. <laughs> Buzz if you want to send us a message, Twitter at the real buzz. The yeah. real buzz. <laughs> <laughs> is there, a, is there a, an, imp an imposter there? A Buzz Aldrin? Is there an at Buzz Aldrin? He's not the real buzz. Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank, thank, thank Buzz again. And we'll see you in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.